Good morning, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to my presentation in bioanalysis of peptides, current method approaches, and future trends. Let's get started. So for the next few minutes, I will be talking about bioanalytical challenges in a peptide hormone or biomarker assay, about ghrelin, hungry for lower sensitivity, and last but not least, Simoa, which makes a tiny but significant difference. The first example, we developed a bioanalytical assay for the detection of a peptide hormone, or in other words, for insulin. As you might know, this is quite challenging because for the preparation of the standards, we often are bound to use a surrogate matrix because otherwise the endogenous counterpart, in this case, the insulin, would interfere with the detection and make it unreliable. However, as you can see, the QCs for sure have to reflect the human patient samples and have to um, be based on the real matrix. So in other words, they have to be spiked on top with insulin. In an ideal world, we then find the graph that is depicted below where the standards and the QCs match perfectly. How we could achieve that and so on, I will be touching base uh, later during the discussion. When we started developing the essay, we based the essay development on a kit, which is very simple depict depicted here, where you have a coating antibody squeezed in between the insulin, and then you go with a secondary detection antibody coupled to HRP. Upon administration of the substrate, you have a change in color, which is then measurable. As with regards for the format, very simple, you have a coating and a detection antibody being the coating antibody body here, OXI005, and the detection on the body UA018. This assay performed very, very well and had a very low cross-reactivity towards all the other insulin analogs. Then what happened is we had to use another kit lot, and then things changed. Again, the ELISA format as depicted to the left was obviously the same. Only thing that was changed is the swap of the detection with the coating antibody. And the provider had not informed us about that, but all of a sudden this assay showed a huge, huge cross-reactivity. So it was no more for use for the, the reliable detection of insulin in that assay. And we had to come up with a solution. What we did is we introduced a special buffer, which then almost abolished all the cross-reactivity towards the main cross-reactants. You can see again the format depicted in the middle with the swap of the antibodies and depicted to the right is validation data showing no cross-reactivity at the LLOQ level of 20 picomolar, neither on the HQC level of 600 um, picomolar. Nevertheless, that's not all. As I had told you, the main challenge was also to look for appropriate surrogate matrix. First, we have tried several zero and tried to deplete insulin, but this was not very reliable, as you can see summarized here to the left. So also here we had to come up with another solution, and also here the solution laid in the development of a special buffer, which was then very reliable and very robust. And last but not least, as you all know, for biomarkers, one of the key uh, criterion or the key parameters is parallelism and you can see depicted here to the right measured in three individuals you could nicely show parallelism at different levels thanks to the robustness of this newly developed method due to also these two buffers that we had uh, specially developed for the insulin measurement in this case. With this, I already come to the summary of the first part of the bioanalytical challenges of this peptide hormone or insulin assay. As I had outlined, the use of surrogate matrix for the standards is critical and the development of this matrix as well, which took us a lot of time, but we ended up with having a very nice and robust assay thanks to the development of a special buffer. And secondly, what we also had to do is in order to abolish cross-reactivity, we developed another uh, buffer or um, made another, another buffer. And both of them then led to very robust and very reliable measurements. In other words, 
be aware of kit lot changes and what their impact might be on your essay. Second example today, again, in the metabolic disease area, if you wish, is ghrelin, hunger, hungry for lower sensitivity. Here also the assay development had started off with a classical ELISA, which would measure in the range of 300 to 1,600 picogram per milliliter. But what we found out is that approximately 90% of all the study samples measured uh, below quantitation range. So we had to come up with another solution. In this case, the solution was the transition from an ELISA method to an LCMS method with an LLOQ of roughly 50 picogram per milliliter plus which was not mentioned before, we were also able to detect both uh, ghrelin species because ghrelin actually exists in two forms, in an acetylated state and in desacyl ghrelin state. As I said, ghrelin belongs to the family of the metabolic uh, hormones or hunger hormone, which you can be, see summarized, depicted here to the left. So upon starvation, ghrelin levels rise, then after food intake, they lower down again, and so on and so forth. And as mentioned before in the introduction, here depicted to the right, you can see ghrelin exists in two forms, in an acetylated form and in as a desacyl ghrelin form. Therefore, anyway, it was prone to develop a method which could measure both forms, namely in this case, an LCMS-MS method. With that, I already come to the first results. So what you can see here in the middle panel top is the between batch precision and accuracy results for acyl ghrelin and the lower panel for desacyl ghrelin. And as you can see at the critical LLOQ level, the accuracy looks quite promising. It's a little bit less promising at the higher end. And this is due to a substantial matrix effect. And therefore we have decided instead of, uh, let's say absolute accuracy to use relative accuracy and this was deemed to be accepted for the measurement of ghrelin in uh, this human matrix. With that, I already come to real data also of the sample measurement or the averages of three different batches. What you can see here, we are having mean values of 125, 40, 74, 111 for acyl ghrelin and for desacyl ghrelin, 170 six and 105, pointing out again to the fact that the majority of the ghrelin levels measured are way below the 300 picogram per milliliter, which was given by the ELISA. In overall, or in total, we measured four, 560 samples with a concentration range from 50 picogram up to 230 picogram per milliliter, and only roughly 27% remained BLOQ. With that, I come already to the summary of the second part, ghrelin, hungry for lower sensitivity. So switching from ELISA to an LCMSMS method allowed to lower the LLQ down to 50 picogram per milliliter. And most importantly, this led to the detection of almost all values which before were BLOQ, which went down from 90 to 27%. And as an addition, Having an LCMS method in place allowed for the detection of both versions of ghrelin of acetylated and the desacetylated form, whereas the ELISA could only quantify the total ghrelin and not discriminate the two forms of this hunger peptide. With this, I already come to the third part where we are looking into SIMOA with which one can detect ultra-sensitive levels of proteins and peptide. As you saw before with ghrelin, we were already down to 50 picogram per milliliter, but if that should not be sufficient, SIMOA might be one of the technologies to apply. And it's very important to note that some potent cancer drugs are really measuring in the low picogram per milliliter or high femtogram per milliliter level where such a technology might be um, used or needed. Additionally, many cytokines and chemokines, particularly also in chronic disease, show small changes within a low analytical range, which could also be uh, where the need for uh, ultra-sensitive technology is also clearly outlined. 
The indications that we are thinking of here is asthma, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, and NASH, for example. <clears throat> but what is Simoa? Well, here depicted to the left is just a picture of the machine. To the right is a short summary of, um, let's say, the format itself. It's nothing else but another more elegant version, if you wish, of an ELISA, where you have a paramagnetic bead coupled to a detection antibody. Then your molecule of interest is bound or squeezed in between. The secondary antibody binds, makes the sandwich, and is coupled to a beta galactosidase subunit. Upon administration of the substrate, then a fluorescent signal is emitted and the, uh, the signal is detected. But what is the difference really between that way of detection and the one of a classical ELISA? Well, this can be answered with the picture shown here to the right, the traditional analog ELISA. You have a signal increase over time and then the integral of this signal gives you the amount um, of or the concentration of your analyte whereas the Simoa technology is really more um, taking picture of single spots or single beads that emit light and is very close to kind of a digital form of um, ELISA allowing for the detection down to femtogram per milliliter. Now, as I said already, where can this be applied or where could this be important? Well, mainly for analysis of cytokines and chemokines in chronic disease. What we did here is we particularly looked into the cytokines IL-6, TNF-alpha, IL-12 and IL-13 in the indications asthma, psoriasis, um, rheumatoid arthritis and NASH. And here I come already to the first results depicted to the left, the results for IL-6. We have the comparison of SIMOA versus mesoscale discovery. What you can see is that the detection level for both technologies is roughly within the same range, but more important what you can see below in the graph um, is that of the total measurements of 74 samples, eight samples were below range with MST technology, technology and none with SIMOA. Similar but different picture when you look at TNF-alpha, TNF-alpha was clearly upregulated in all chronic disease compared to healthy states. And again, of the measured 74 samples, two were below range when we applied MSD and none of them when we applied CIMOA technology. Now the next two cytokines, IL-12P70 and IL-13, Similar picture as before, only significantly different when looked at rheumatoid arthritis compared to healthy individuals, but again, more important than actually the concentration range alone is the number of individuals that could not be reliably measured with MSD, which is uh, 57 in the case of IL-12 P70. And all of them, if we look to the right, uh, and tried to measure IL-13. So the power of this ultra-sensitive technology does not rely only and mainly in the detection of low abundant proteins for, for a, a low concentration, but also, and this is very important, we could reliably detect these values with CIMOA and not with mesoscale, for example. And with that, I come already to the conclusion of the CIMOA part. So CIMOA allows for detection of protein peptides in the femtogram per, and picogram per milliliter range. It has been together with clients or on clients wish successfully established as Celerion for the detection of these low abundant cytokines involved in chronic disease. And in the comparative study that I have mentioned before, we could demonstrate that in certain occasions, CIMOA was superior to mesoscale discovery, particularly when we looked at the number of BLQ values uh, with um, MSD versus CIMOA. And at this very moment, we went a step further away from the cytokine and chemokine into the peptide, and we are developing assays for the detection of peptide drugs, which really require this low level of the detection in the lower picogram per milliliter or higher femtogram per milliliter range. 
And with this, I would like to thank the whole Solarium team, as well as you, for your attention. Thank you very much.